As the Usuri Boreal Coniferous Forests, commonly known as the Taiga, stretch out to meet the Pacific Ocean, the brown bear begins to lose its status as the national symbol of Russia. There, in the ridges of Sikotelin Mountains, the bear meets his great rival, the Amur tiger, a proud, solitary and enigmatic predator. The Amur tiger is one of the largest of all the tiger subspecies on Earth, and the only one which survives in deep snowdrifts. Few other countries in the world can boast such great treasures. The tiger is one of the nature's most efficient hunters. In contrast to lions, bulls and hyenas, who survive by communal hunting, the tiger hunts alone. He taxes his kingdom only when necessary, taking as much as he needs to survive. Minutes after a successful hunt, survivors can relax and enjoy a welcome spell of peace and quiet for the next couple of days. Wild boar, red deer, sika, roe and other prey give a communal sigh of relief. Ну в окно заглядывала на это, а потом услышал 4 часа утра этот э, виск собак, все побоялся выходить, а потом уже когда это утром-то вышел, гляжу собаки нету. Ну вот тут была привязана здесь, перескочила вместе с цепью и назад ушла. During the 1980s, the boreal forest abounded in wild bull. Tigers were happy and well fed. Tigresses gave birth to many cubs, assured that their litters would not face starvation. This was for the first time in 40 years of the more tiger conservation efforts that the tiger's population had hit a high, with tigers colonizing every potential range. But in 1983, ill fortune struck. Hit by Kana and distemper, the wild boar was driven near to extinction. Tigers turned to red and roe deer, as an alternative source of food. However, it never rains, but it pours. Deep snows in the winters of 1985 through 1987 brought about a massive loss of ungulate prey. With the boreal forest emptying, there was virtually no food for the tiger to find. Driven by famine, tigers started to frequent populated areas, snatching dogs and attacking livestock. In the winter of 1986, Tiger tracks were found at a trolleybus station in the suburbs of the city of Vladivostok, causing great panic among residents. The Communist Party responded quickly. With an eye to civilian protection, a special brigade was formed to control big predators. Literally, it stood for war on invasive tigers. According to official permits, 48 conflict tigers were killed during the anti-tiger crusade. At the time, 
these killings went unquestioned. Tigers that had come out from the depths of the forest were perceived as dangerous and received death sentences without investigation or trial. During that time, the Siberian boreal forest had not yet been pillaged by voracious timber dealers and was still rich in Korean pines. It was here that the most cautious tigers found their refuge. Those of them who had learnt their lesson well. Man is a mortal danger and you should keep away from him, ideally beyond the distance of a rifle shot. Korean pine forests are a unique ecosystem in the taiga. In winter and summer, these forests enjoy a special microclimate with its own oxygen plant rich in antimicrobic ions and phytoncides. Rich soils and a great diversity of plants and animals are to be found here. In a plentiful year, the pine yields up to half a ton of cone seeds per hectare which proves a great feast for birds, animals and people alike. The nuts present a very tasty and rich product and are used to produce oil and milk. They are much larger than Siberian pine seeds and keep their nutritional value longer. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, conifer deciduous forests were very often the only source of income for inhabitants of remote villages. People used to value and protect the Korean pine. Yet, as the infamous epoch of Russian capitalism dawned, a new breed of people came to the taiga. These were people who wanted only to swell their purses, the Korean pine capitalists. The looters of the taiga, pursuing short-term interests, brought chainsaws and went cutting into the woods. However, following a strong public protest, a ban was imposed on industrial logging of pine in 1989. Owing to an abundance of natural fodders, the population of ungulates, which managed to survive in conifer deciduous forests, was quick to recover, a process which ran parallel to the recovery of the Amur taiga which had suffered severe losses in the war with man. The start of the 1990s saw the Iron Curtain fall. As borders were opened, Primoria became inundated with smugglers from nearby China, ready to buy up the whole of the taiga. Nearly every hunter dreamt of striking it rich by killing a taiga and selling its skin to Chinese buyers at fabulous prices. Many were tempted to try their luck, and a new war on tigers began. Yet, tiger bones brought fortune to nobody. Hunters died in the taiga as well, some of them from the teeth and claws of tigers they stalked.
The repercussions of the Tiger War could be felt all over the world. In 1994, the World Wide Fund for Nature launched its operation in the Russian Far East with a project designed to protect the Amur Tiger. Upon the initiative of a number of non-government organizations, a Special Inspection Team Tiger was set up, equipped and initially endowed with a broad scope of responsibilities. Seven anti-poaching brigades were established to protect Angelus, the tiger's prey. With the support of the WWF and the Phoenix Fund, inspectors managed to confiscate 78 tiger hides. Over 13,000 poachers were detained, over 4,000 rifles were confiscated, and over 500 lawsuits were filed. Due to this joint effort, the community managed to put an end to outrageous breaches of all limits by poachers and succeeded in stabilizing the tiger population at numbers of around 450 individuals. However, the end of the Iron Curtain did not only bring evil, it also triggered rapid development of international cooperation in the field of science. On the initiative of the Maurice Honecker Institute and the Pacific Institute of Geography, in the Far East branch of the Russian Academy of Sciences, the Secretary Alain Reserve saw a successful launch of the Russian-American Amur Tiger project, which inaugurated invaluable practices, capturing live tigers, immobilizing them with darts, and transporting them to designated places. A new breed of Russian professionals didn't take long to emerge and thanks to an effective mix of information from radio colors and traditional tracking methods, scientists began to gather a large amount of new data about tiger ecology. This then formed the basis for Russia's national strategy of Amur tiger conservation. While his mother relaxes, taking her nap in the bushes, away from the scorching sun and blood-sucking mosquitoes, after an exhausting hunt, her well-fed offspring goes to play hunt along the bank of a stream. He fancies himself quite grown up, a big tiger who can do everything for himself. However, for the time being, he is so awkward that not only the ungulates, but the frogs from the stream see him and run away in dismay. Even so, this gives him huge pleasure at this stage of his development. He sees in himself a terrible and awe-inspiring master of his domain. Still, some animals do not want to escape, they see no need. The young hunter seems to be smitten by the proportions of an adult female red deer. An attempt to frighten a Himalayan black bear ends in vain as well. But there will come a day when the cub will undoubtedly see him again. Just then, the true master of the realm becomes apparent. A full-grown male tiger is on a tour of inspection around his property. The tiger cub faces grave danger. Who knows what the big tiger has on his mind, what mood he is in. He is not necessarily the cub's father. He might kill another tiger's cub quite without a second thought. 
In fact, among tigers, even natural fathers do not display affection and fondness towards their offspring, and they are not involved in rearing. The father's opposite, female tigers are ready to do anything for their cubs. For her cub's sake, a mother tiger will challenge the male, a considerably larger and stronger animal. But the big male prefers not to have anything to do with his protective mother. After all, in his vast territory, there are many other shady Korean pines for him to rest under. This family is lucky. Their territory lies inside a nature reserve, where logging is illegal. However, in Russia, protected areas make up just 20% of the tiger's habitat, so most other tigers are much less lucky. Not every shot a poacher takes turns out deadly. Wandering the forests of the Sikatea Lin are a great number of wounded animals. More or less every other tiger carries a bullet or some shot under its skin. These exhausted and wounded animals, unable to catch a boar or deer, often seek out villages and settlements in search of easy food. The Inspection Tiger Group set up a unit called Gothic Tiger to deal with such situations. However, this time, in contrast to the 1980s, the unit included not only good marksmen, but biologists and scientists as well, armed with their own special equipment. The rules of this new game saw drastic changes. From now on, every tiger which appeared in a village or a settlement would be frightened away instead of shot. Where appearances recurred, the infringing visitor would be captured and examined. Any tiger who followed and attacked a hunter would be captured and confined. And only if a tiger should kill and eat a man would he be subject to the ultimate punishment of extermination. However, things failed to be so simple. In the remote settlement of Chernigovka, a situation for capturing a tiger who had been killing dogs seemed ideal. Snow that year was so deep that the tiger had to plow his way through drifts up to his belly. He could not cover big distances and had to make use of roads and leave tracks which gave him away without fail. However, traps failed to catch the tiger and no tracks were found on nearby roads. The following morning news came from a village 20 kilometers away that a dog had been attacked that night. New traps were laid, and people started to search, following the roads. The next morning brought another message about a morning attack on a dog in a different place. This pattern repeated itself over two torturous weeks. The culprit worked his patch professionally, never to be seen more than once in any place, never returning to the scene of his crime, always staying away from roads. The solution to this crime spree, when it came, was a surprise. A railway linking local mining settlements was being kept clean and maintained in good condition on a daily basis by diligent railway workers. A perfect route for a tiger who made use of this functional, practical infrastructure, enabling him to travel to unexpected destinations. As a result, this tiger was never captured. At another village, Rakovka, a tiger tried to attack a cow. The fortunate victim's injuries were not serious, no more than a few scratches. The assailant settled 500 meters away from the farm, apparently convinced it would be easier to wait for waste products from slaughter to be dumped, so he could eat when the coast was clear. At first, he was keen for nobody to detect him, and would take his meals under cover of darkness but eventually he started to frequent the place at daylight. He displayed no fear of people. This type of behavior posed a serious threat, not only to the livestock, but now to people themselves. On arriving at the village, the conflict tiger team had no difficulty in determining that the predator was seriously ill. To shoot the looter would have presented no problem. 
The tiger was hardly able to drag his feet along, could not run at all, and was switched to shuffling after just a few jumps. It was easy to catch up with him in the open field. Nevertheless, the team took a courageous decision to capture the tiger alive. The object was to give him a thorough inspection and pronounce on his condition only after a full medical checkup. A trap was set at his habitual feeding place. The following day, the tiger was taken into custody. He failed to show any resistance and displayed a strange pattern of behavior, different to healthy tigers in a trap. The specialist immobilized the tiger and conducted a thorough medical examination. Quick to establish that irreversible processes were at play, with no chances of improvement, the team decided to put the tiger down by injection. This gorgeous male tiger got into a poacher's snare, but he was lucky enough to escape a sad fate as he was found not by his trapper, but by good people who did not touch him and reported his discovery. The Catholic Tiger team managed to come while the tiger was still alive. The tiger was immobilized and delivered to a special confinement unit for treatment. After he had successfully undergone a series of treatment procedures to help him recover his health, he was immobilized again, fitted with radio collar and delivered in full comfort to his native hunting grounds. Thus, the start of the third millennium saw relations between man and the tiger rise to a new level. From then on, the death penalty for conflict tigers without investigation and trial would be cancelled. It takes a tiger over a year to master all the intricacies of hunting alone, under the guidance of his or her mother. At this stage, the tiger begins to come of age, gains independence and has to find his or her own hunting ground, his territory. This is the most difficult task, as the prime hunting grounds are typically monopolized by adult tigers. A tiger's hunting ground is not just a section of forest, it is an area where he must catch and kill no less than 50 anglers each year. Those that escape and remain uneaten should survive long enough to replenish the prey stock and enable the tiger to know no shortages. The tegar is no supermarket, and no animal agrees voluntarily to fall prey to a tiger. Even a skilled adult tiger concludes many hunts without dinner. Though he may be king of the taiga, the emu tiger is no long-distance running champion. 
His strengths lie in sprints and rushes. Tigers fight with each other for control of the best territories. Those who fail to find their plot of land in the reserve do their best to settle in hunting leases, where wildlife biologists have greatly increased ungulate numbers. The abolition of a death penalty is an historical milestone for tigers, yet it presupposes the establishment of special facilities for probation of these large sheep who have left the straight and narrow. In theory this seems quite understandable, however in practice things are far from ideal. Often tiger cubs trying to survive without the protection of their lost mothers regularly come to villages to catch dogs. Such tigers first enter a private facility at the Tiger Special Inspection Unit. From now on, the heavy financial burdens of treatment and feeding are taken on by non-government organizations. If the cubs survive and pass quarantine, they still have a long way to go, not to prison, but to another private facility based in Habarisk region at the Cliff Rehabilitation Center for Wild Animals. A tiger cub begins to shake off the stress of transportation in a special cell with a den he dares only to leave at night. Judging by his reaction to inanimate objects, such as an automatic video camera, there has been no habit forming so far. The tiger has retained innate fear, a sign that he can safely undergo rehabilitation treatment. When the small tiger regains his strength, a door is opened, leading to a spacious confinement area, where he will have to master the basics of hunting, learning to catch real live food to eat. His reaction to video cameras confirms that the sub-adult tiger has preserved fear of human beings, which presents the main prerequisite for his survival in the wild. But what is to be done next? Will he be placed in a zoo or sent to a circus? In 2002, following an initiative by the Wildlife Conservation Society, the Inspection Tiger Unit set out to conduct a bold experiment. Two young female tigers who had undergone a complete cycle of rehabilitation were radio colored and released back into the wild. Radio tracking data clearly indicated that both tigresses had adopted quite well to the taiga. Each of them had learned to hunt on her own and succeeded in obtaining enough meat to survive. Each of them had managed to evade confrontations with bears. Neither of them came out to villages and no attempts were made at catching dogs or goats. Despite this, 
The fate of one of these tigresses is unknown. Her color suddenly went silent several months later. The other tigress managed to establish a hunting ground of her own, where she saw through not only the winter, but also the following spring and summer, hunting full-grown wild bull. Till now, the fate of the Amur tiger has been lying in the hands of the human citizens of Primoria, who share their territory with the tiger. The new age has brought new trouble. Now, it is not only individual tigers, but the whole tiger population that faces danger. The tiger's living facility stands in constant jeopardy. The ban on commercial Korean pine logging has been blatantly violated, often on the pretext of so-called maintenance cuttings. According to official WWF statistics, the 2000s saw cuttings of up to half a million cubic meters of Korean pine each year. And even this ban has been lifted according to the new Russian Forest Code. Now, Korean tree forests in tiger habitat will be subject to merciless logging. From the moment the first slums appeared on the banks of the Amur River, no head of Russian government has declared his or her personal commitment to the cause of tiger preservation. But one summer, Vladimir Putin set out on a journey to the Ussuriski Nature Reserve to put a high-tech GPS collar on an immobilized tigress. Having planted a kiss on her, he subsequently spoke about his government's responsibility for the preservation of the tiger as a symbol of national heritage. This kiss turned a new chapter in the history of relations between man and the Amor tiger. Today, three tigers wear on their necks the satellite amulets of Mr. Putin. Let's hope that the academic research project in one reserve will spill over into a long-term national conservation program supported by the Russian government. As the Usuri Boreal Coniferous Forest, commonly known as the Taiga, stretch out to meet the Pacific Ocean, the brown bear begins to lose its status as the national symbol of Russia. There, in the ridges of Sikatealin Mountains, the bear meets his great rival, the Amur Taiga, a proud, solitary and enigmatic predator. The Amur tiger is one of the largest of all the tiger subspecies on Earth, and the only one which survives in deep snowdrifts. Few other countries in the world can boast such great treasures. We were busy with the final credits when a call for action yeah, came in the studio. studio. In the vicinity of the city of Osirisk, an adult tiger was visiting a hunting base at night, causing the frightened watchman to call the helpline of the Department for Hunting Inspection and the Special Inspection Tiger Unit. By the time the specialist arrived, the tiger had been found maniacally prosecuting a slowly moving truck, trying to bite its wheels. The behavior of this tiger was clearly abnormal. 
Such an unusual tiger definitely posed a threat to the residents of the nearby settlement of Alexeyevka. As a result, a decision was taken to immobilize the beast and to examine him thoroughly. The tiger displayed the same pattern of behavior as the tiger who had died the previous year in the Cliff Rehabilitation Center. However, there is no need for drawing any preliminary conclusions or making any other pronouncements on his health. After the tiger had been placed in a special cage, biological samples were taken to determine whether there were any possible viral infections or other causes of such abnormalities. The pattern of behavior of this tiger greatly resembled one that was observed in the tiger last year on the Vladivostok Habarovsk Highway, where the tiger caused jams and posed a hurdle to traffic. He was captured, delivered to the Cliff Rehabilitation Center, and died there despite efforts by staff. He died of canine distemper. Incidentally, on the same day as the truck tiger was found, experts from Special Inspection Tiger Team and the Department for Hunting Inspection captured another tiger at the other end of Primoria, a small one. This orphan tiger cub made his living at a dumping ground near a village.